Meanwhile, Meekum is like, the killer is going to strike again. The first time it was on the 13th, and the second time it was eight days later than the 13th. And today is eight days later than the last time it was 13th, and it's a full moon, even though we see the moon in a few minutes, and it's not full. It's like three quarters, but somebody else is going to die. Hey, Maniacs. Hey, Maniacs. Welcome to Midsummer Maniacs. This is episode seven. Which covers season two, episode two, Strangler's Wood. Yes. <laughs> Just a reminder off the top, like we always do, uh, if you let your kids watch the show, they should be able to f- be fine to listen to the podcast. But if they do not, can't handle the show, then they can't handle this podcast. I don't know. I can't handle Toby's hair. Toby's hair is fantastic. <laughs> he makes his debut as the coroner, I, filling in for George, and he's got an awesome mullet. Did they say, hold on, we haven't noogied it enough? Yes, noogie it more. Make it look like he just took off one of those paper bonnets. No, more. More. Make it sweaty. <laughs> noogie it more. Uh, this episode was filmed June and July of 98 and broadcast the 3rd of February, 1999. Uh, 10.7 million viewers, which is more than the last episode. Hey. This is also, once again, not a book. It's an original screenplay. In fact, there's no more books to talk about. No. There's books that weren't turned into episodes, but there are no more episodes based on books. Exactly. We're off the rails now. Directed by Jeremy Silberton, Silberston, and once again, written by Anthony Horowitz. Again, it has those weird watercolor credits at the beginning with the spooky store window. In what will become a midsummer tradition, we have an episode that starts with a milkman driving his little milk float around. Now, this is the same milk company as the last episode, but it is not the same milkman who is credited as the milkman, but actually is called Darren. Darren. He does have a name. Anthony Howes plays him. He speaks a line. He's He is a line. Yeah, because Leonard calls him Darren. I kind of want to drive one of those little milk floats. They look so fun. They do look fun. <laughs> Semi-skimmed. <laughs> For our American listeners, semi-skimmed is what we call skimmed. It's skim milk. Oh, I thought that would be 2%. No. Nope. Semi-skimmed isn't 2%? Semi-skimmed is skimmed in the United oh, States. I didn't know that. And it doesn't come in bags. It comes in bottles. That's for our Canadian listeners. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> we don't do that bag thing here in the United States like you Canadians do. Nope. So we're introduced to Leonard Pike. I, for one, love Leonard Pike. He's wonderfully snooty and is one of those poor men who must see to his nostril hairs every single day. They're (laughs) huge. (laughs) He does a good job. He does. But his nostrils are open for the world. Yes. And it's even made worse because he's so snooty. He keeps his nose in the air quite a bit. He does indeed. So he runs the the hotel. The hotel that, uh, if I can interject, is actually... Dorney Court. It stands in, this house has been given no less than three different names in the course of episodes. It became the Fox and Goose Hotel in an early episode, Strangler's Woods, and appears in two later episodes. This is once again from the Midsummer's On Location book. So do we know what town, what village we're in? In In a village that's not named because they say I moved to the village, but it's Coston all the way. Okay. So it's not a specific little village. So we've got this hotel. The milkman is delivering milk. Leonard Pike meets him at the door. Yep. And then the milkman drives on. And we get a creepy old guy coming out of the woods. A creepy old guy in the woods with a tie. Yeah, we don't know who he is yet, right? Nope. We get a lady doing Tai Chi with a sword. Yeah, so that that's Liz Francis. And she's played by Trudy Styler, who is Sting's wife. What? White what? <laughs> yeah, she is Sting's wife. Since like ni- tantric Since Sting's 1992. Wife? Oh. They've been married. They have four kids together. My. So here's a little interesting tidbit. (laughs) A little interesting tidbit. (laughs) Beyond just that she's Sting's wife. So when they met in 92, she was 
um, in a play and dating Peter O'Toole. Okay, Peter O'Toole is easily 40 years older than her. He would have been in his 60s. Yeah. And she would have been in her 30s. So 30 years older. Peter O'Toole was quite the man, though. Quite the man. Right? Even in his 60s, he's the man. And in walks Sting. Oh, choices, choices. I think she went with the right one. Well, you know. For longevity. Longevity and tantrism. Yeah, if you don't know about that in Sting, you can Google it. Yeah, just... Well, anyway, okay. <laughs> so, so Trudy's got some exciting life going on. I, I guess so. The Tai Chi with the sword is just a small part. Now, I and I mentioned this to you before I watched this episode again, I knew about Leonard. But for some reason, I thought she was the killer or yeah. she had caused this or something. It's funny when you go back to watch an episode you haven't watched in a while. And you, they, they always start with kind of the cast of characters. You kind of see them in situ in some way. You're introduced to them. And your memory plays tricks on you. I thought for sure she had something to do with it. Like, I thought the actor who played Leonard Pike, whose name is Peter Iyer, I could have swore he was the same actor who was in a later episode who's a nudist. Yeah, that's those are completely different guys. Yeah, but, I mean, they're both tall, but... And they have nostrils. <laughs> yeah, everybody does. So then we go to the Merrill household. Oh, before that, though, Bill Mitchell drives by. Oh, that's right. Yawali! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Bill Mitchell in his convertible almost runs the milk float off the road. He does. Yeah, we'll talk about Bill. We move on to the Merrill household, and we are introduced to a gem. Anna. Anna Santa Rosa. Played by Debbie Chazen, I think is how you say her last name. Who is not Brazilian. No. She's, Not Portuguese. She's British. She's British. Yes. But she has this awesome, over-the-top Brazilian accent and pretends not to understand English. No eggs, Anna. You want eggs? She just opens the door with... Jays? Yes. Jays? <laughs> the milk he come. <laughs> you know, but it doesn't surprise me that Debbie Chazen can do an accent that's pretty convincing. She... I don't think I'd ever seen her in anything before this. But after this, she's in a Sherlock. You might not recognize her in the Sherlock because she's very thin in the Sherlock. The scene where he's in his mind palace and he's in like a courtroom and he's interviewing all of the women who have dated the man. Oh, that's right. She's in that. She's there. She was also in Torchwood for a while. But the reason why I'm not surprised she can do accents is she speaks five languages. Does she actually speak Portuguese? No, but she does speak Spanish. Okay. Well, maybe we'll get it confused like Troy does. Troy does, does. yeah. But she, she speaks French, English, of course, the Russian, German, and Spanish. She's fluently. Fluent that's, in several languages. That's impressive for she's anybody. an absolute fun lady. Yeah, she is fun. She's in another Midsummer. She's in Midsummer Life, which is a 2008 episode without a Brazilian accent. No, she draws the pictures. Yeah. So we've got the breakfast scene. We've got Kate, who's the mother, and John, her husband. Don't you mean Lady Jane? Yeah, Lady Jane from Lovejoy. Right? Yeah, there's another show if you haven't watched it. You got to go watch Lovejoy. It's not really a murder mystery, but it's awesome. With really bad Italian accents. (laughs) Ian McKellen? Ian McKellen. Right. So we've got this um, kind of hectic morning situation where Anna's trying to force eggs on people. Kate notices that her husband, John, doesn't have on his watch. I've lost it. The Rolex. No, way. no, no. He took it in for repairs. I took it in for repairs. And then there's David, their son. The rudest child on the planet. Yeah, my notes just say, super rude. <laughs> He's a little asshole. He won't even say goodbye. <gasps> Off on his bike into the woods. But then we we find out later why he's in such a hurry. So the kids in the woods make fun of him. Yeah. And then the kid in the who obviously is like a bully character then goes, "Where are you going? Come back!" Like, because that's what bullies do. Yeah, I don't come back so I can hit you. It was. It Where was you going? Weird. Yeah. But they go off into the woods, and what do they find? They find a naked dead lady with a tie around her neck. And she's not English. You can tell by looking at her. She's bare naked. 
neck. Not really, no. no, because you could clearly see her shirt. <laughs> well, she's got like a flesh tone leotard on. Yeah, like a flesh tone leotard. Well, there. they couldn't exactly have her do the same naked body acting as they do in later episodes no. with m- male, no. small part actors. So but. you hit on something there, though, because Troy, in a later in a scene coming up in a few minutes, says she's not British, she's naked. Yeah. <laughs> Well, didn't you know British people never get naked? And she's not talking. No. So how exactly does Troy know she's British? He can just, he, not, not British. British. He can just tell by looking at her. She looks foreign in the way foreign people are naked. I guess. Carla Costanza. Yeah. So we get the old credits. Lovely cold opening. Ends with a naked, a naked dead lady in Foreigner. the forest. Foreigner. <laughs> And then we see that Joyce is going away. It's such a kerfuffle. It's like she has a baby at home. You know, like I remember when the kids were super small, anywhere I went, I made sure whoever was watching out for them, like, you know, okay, this is here and this is there. And if this happens, then do this and call me and my number and la 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 la. These are two grown adults. She's, she's leaving. just leaving Tom and Cully behind and they can't get her out of the house soon enough. With lots of food. And is her f- hair flat or is it flat? It's, uh, okay. As mentioned in the last podcast, Cully's hair is awesome and Joyce's hair is awful. But it's awful in a new way. In the episode before, she had this weird like bubble on yeah. top. And now it's like they've just said, no, that was bad. We're just not going to do anything to her hair now. We're just going to flatten it to her head so she looks sad. And, so, and, and Cully, season two Cully... Pixie cut, no sleeves. <laughs> Mock turtleneck, no sleeves. Mock turtleneck, no sleeves. Because your neck gets sleeve. cold, but your arms don't. <laughs> so she's leaving, and, uh, you know, they're going to have a little father-daughter time, except, of course, the phone rings. And, and, you know. He's already absent-minded. That old trope. Like, Joyce, is she gone yet? What? Whatever. Tom's gone. Yep. He's got a case. Yes. Some kids on the way to Coston Comprehensive, Troy's old school, and Brian Clapper's old school. So my cl- question is, did some of these students have Brian Clapper? Are you sure it's the same school? Because these kids have uniforms on and the kids in Brian Clapper's school didn't. They say it. Huh. They must have gone uniform since. I guess. Since the Brian Clapper incident. <laughs> so there's a woman, Starkers, in the forest, strangled with a necktie. But that is not the most fantastic thing in the forest. The most fantastic thing with five exclamation marks in my notes. Toby. It's Toby Jones. As Dan Peterson. Who, so Toby Jones, if you're not familiar with him, you probably are familiar with him. You probably watched this episode and went, wait a minute. Haven't I seen him in something else? You've seen him in everything else. In everything else. And if you haven't watched The Detectorists, oh my gosh, you are missing out. You have to go watch that show. Pause this. Go watch that show. The Detectorist may be the best half hour comedy show of the last 20 years. It's so subtle and beautiful and funny. And hilarious. And Toby's great in it. Toby is fantastic. This is not his best acting, but it is his worst hair. It is. Because George is away. Where where did George go? He's in Corfu. That's in Greece? It's in Greece. Yeah. So George is finally getting a vacation, you know, because that last crime scene was too much for him. So... Still, we have no idea how they've discovered that this young lady is foreign. Yeah, they're all saying she's foreign. But they find some clothes. Yeah, and they clearly have tags where the clothes were made in Sao Paulo. Italy? Brazil. Yet another time (laughs) in this episode in which (laughs) Troy does not understand that Italy is where people speak Italian. Yeah. And that Portugal is where people speak Portuguese, and Brazil is where people speak Portuguese, and Spain is where people speak Spanish. And other countries. It's all Hey, he went to Cost and Comprehensive. What can you expect? Uh, Brian Clapper. (laughs) Maybe he was a geography teacher, too. (laughs) (laughs) That would explain a lot of Troy's (laughs) confusion about geography. And they find a man's watch. Yeah, they find a, a nice Rolex. And they, beautiful. and they know right away that a Rolex is expensive enough that they're going to be able to track down the owner but, by a serial number. And that's true, by the way. 
And Tom remembers where he is. Where is he? Strangler's Woods. It's but only a, not woods. Wood. It's wood. Yeah. There's a single wood. That's not the real name of it. It's really Raven's Wood, right? Yes. But it's known as, as Strangler's Wood because years ago, what, nine years ago? Nine years ago. Three women were murdered by strangulation in those woods. And it's an old case, and they go back to the station house, and they look at some old papers. Yeah. Now, I got to tell you, the people who did the production documents for this episode went above and beyond. Yeah, they did. They did a really good job. Not only these newspapers, but when we get into the old guy's secret Strangler's Wood Room, that the stuff on the walls is just incredible. Yeah. And we've watched a couple documentaries about people who create that kind of documentation that create paper props for movies and TV shows. And the amount of work that goes into something that really is meant to not stand out is incredible. Yeah, just for instance, the Cost and Echo, the paper they show first, it's your favorite local newspaper, number one for news and events. Things that do not, like, only strange individuals like me look at this. It's 18P, the horror, horror in local beauty spot. There's a body in a woods headline. It's by Barry Dawson. <laughs> you really did look at it closely. And there's a picture of a tree. <laughs> Now, I would have really been impressed if the reporter's name was the same name as the girl uh, in the um, cult episode. I'm betting that somebody involved with the production of these papers is named Barry Dawson. Probably. That would be a good little thing to put in there, wouldn't it? And then they show the sun, which is a known entity in England. Yeah. Right? England has national newspapers the way that USA Today is a national newspaper here right. in the U.S. But they're very tabloidy. Yeah. Right? News of the world and the sun especially. So the sun is huge headlines. Monday, June 14th, horror as young woman found raped and strangled in Strangler's Woods. But you can also win 60,000 pounds in bingo. Hey. Exactly. And this is where we get one of our first big in- inconsistencies with this episode, isn't it? They've got a, a photo of... No, no, we, do, we haven't yet. got to the, the... This is all old papers. Oh, okay, yeah. Those are the papers about the original three yes. killings in the woods. Barnaby asks Troy to get on the phone to the Rolex people and to talk to whoever is investigated that case originally. And we find out that's George Meekum. And as soon as we see him, we know he was the creepy guy in the woods when the milk float went by. So he's bowling. Yes. Lawn bowling. Yes. At the lawn bowling club. Yes. Why do you have to wear white? Because it's a lawn bowling thing. The Why? In one of those, I'm Canadian, so I'm close to being British things that Canadians do. Uh, there was lawn bowling in the town I grew up with. All the towns that I grew up in. And they all wore white. Why? I don't know. So that they could get stains on the grass. That's what I've always thought too. And I don't understand why cricket players always wear white either. I also have a question about this lawn bowling shot. There is a dolly shot here. And it's a rapid dolly shot. So they probably laid down rails. Okay, wait a minute. You're talking all movie maker thing here. Speak English. So when they filmed the ball rolling on the ground. Yeah. They had the camera low to the ground, on a series of rails, being pushed along as the ball went down the the uh, the pitch. Is it not possible that a cameraman just had his camera really low, maybe on a stick or something, and just moved along smoothly? It wouldn't have been as smooth as it is. Well, they went to a lot of effort for that shot. They did. I, I don't understand why. Somebody got a new set of rails or something. I guess so. Wanted to use them. <laughs> It's a beautiful shot, and it introduces, wow, the uppity, stuffity retiredness of that whole bowling club. (laughs) Exactly. And especially George Meekum, who is angry. Yes, he is. You'll never find who killed them. I couldn't find him. You won't find him. Ever, ever, ever. I suppose you need my help. No, we don't. We'll consult you if we need you. (laughs) Yes. But where does he live? Loose End House. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they named it. Yeah. They moved, he and his wife moved there just so they could be closer to the crime scenes because he's so obsessed. 
So while Barnaby's talking to George, Troy's doing some actual police work. Yeah. He gets a bunch of information about the watch and and uh, is off on some bad driving adventures. Yeah, and when Tom gets in the car, he can brief him on all kinds of boring stuff that we didn't have to watch him figure out, right? No, super super good explanation and super good uh, dialogue. There. Including the fact that they should keep this coroner, this police surgeon, because Toby is a magician. He's a magician. Not only does he have the mullet. The mullet. And the white the paper noogie, suit. The noogie, the noogie mullet. <laughs> That's going to be the name of the episode. Toby's noogie mullet. That was the name <laughs> of my fourth grade band. <laughs> and up next, Toby's noogie mullet. Hey! No, but Toby has been able to figure out that not only did Carla die about a week ago, but it was between nine and midnight. It's amazing. How does he know that? He's a miracle worker. How does he know that? The only way you can know a window of time like that is body temperature. And by the time she's been there a week, that's moot. It's not like she had a watch. Just before she died, she wrote on her skin, I'm a foreigner and I was killed at this time. Between nine and midnight. Yes. But we have to trust Toby's information. We'll go, we'll go with it, right? I trust in Toby. And we know now that Troy has traced the watch. Yes. Meekum goes home. We meet his wife. Emily. And we learn how crazy he is. Woo. He's nutsy bubbo. Because she knows he was in the woods. Yep. And sometimes he even stays the night there. And then he goes upstairs into his strangler's wood room. His murder room. And he dramatically opens the door. It opens the drawer. It's full of ties. It's full of ties. And he takes a tie <laughs> out. He wraps it around his neck. And he makes the weirdest Oh my face. gosh, that face. That actor must have regretted that face. And there should just be like a big, like school of fish swimming across the screen. Red herrings, red herrings, yep. red herrings. <laughs> <laughs> Then Troy and and Barnaby go to the watch repair shop. They've mm-hmm. traced it down. The watch repair guy is fantastic. Sebastian he's so fun. Renwick. Yeah, he's such a great name. And he says it's a, a Rolex Oyster Perpetual GMT Master. Yes. Which in the U.S. sells between $12,000 and $15,000. Kabanga. That is not a cheap watch. It's not my watch. To have just... You know, oh, I lost it. Well, she is Lady Jane, and she does write an agony and call him. Yeah. That must bring in the big bucks. <laughs> he says that Troy is tetchy. Tetchy. We find out that Kate Merrill is an agony aunt uh, with the blonde lady. Yeah, Kate and Liz write this agony aunt column together, though you can't imagine that it, it pays hardly anything. And if you split it between two people, it really doesn't pay. Yeah. I don't. How does Liz support herself? She well, doesn't have a job. She has no job. She's got Sting. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. She's got a beautiful house. She does. A sword to do Tai Chi with. Sword to do Tai Chi. And a laptop. Crazy. A laptop and a lot of dandelion tea. She does have a lot of dandelion tea. So she must be like independently wealthy or her divorce settlement was really, really good. I guess I so. I guess. I guess her ex-husband was super rich. The reason why Barnaby and Troy show up there is because they found out the watch was bought by Kate Merrill. Yeah, for her husband. So they show up and Anna, again, is in fine form. <laughs> Two men, they come. Two men, they come. <laughs> she just walks away. <laughs> now, she is supposed to be an au pair, not a maid. She's not the housekeeper. She's supposed to be watching David. And, but then she just slams the door and leaves. She's just... Well, she's not doing a very good job with David either. No. Because he's a jerk face. In fact, I don't think... I'm pretty sure they don't appear in a scene together. Other than that breakfast scene? Yeah, no, that's it. That's it. Uh, Elizabeth is there. That's the blonde lady. And Troy obviously reads and has sent in information yeah. to the agony and I so want to know what he wrote in about. And so when you write into like... Dear Abby or something, you don't put your full name. You go like confused in Chicago Troy or something. Troy and Costin. I'm in love with the governor's daughter. My boss's daughter wears a mock turtle with no sleeves. Hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's this whole kind of dancing around, you know, like she says, I recognize your name or whatever. Yeah. So, 
So now Kate knows that he lied, that John lied about where his watch was. You're right. And then Elizabeth wants to leave. Again, in the rewatching it the first time, I'm like, oh, she's in on it. Because she wants to get out of there as soon as possible. But no, she's just being polite. You know, being a nice person who doesn't want to be so nosy into their neighbor's affairs. John's in London. He works for Monarch Tobacco. No, that's not in London. It's no, in, no, but it's he, in Costin. It's in Costin, but he's in London. He's in London. Meeting yes. with the marketing people. You're right. We don't see that. We don't see that meeting yet, though. No. And uh, they moved there just before the first murders nine years ago. Yeah. So all of our players were in that area. Yes. When the murders happened. Exactly. And then we get this weird little flash to London. They do one shot of the intersection of Harley Street in London. It's the street in London best known for medical practices. Absolutely. So they've got this nice little B-roll shot that identifies the street, and then we're in the interior. We could be anywhere. Yep. And it's clearly a doctor's consulting room, and somebody's pouring gasoline everywhere and lighting it on fire. They have that old phrenology skull. Yeah, because, you know. Doctors still do phrenology. It still amazes me that they even pretend that any doctor's surgery could look like an oak paneled office where the only sign that there's a doctor at all is that over in the corner, there's this nice tufted leather examination table that's never been touched. And the phrenology head. Well, that could be in anybody's office. I guess. They're just interesting. So I guess the idea is if you go to Harley Street, the doctor doesn't touch you. I guess You just not. sit across the table and just tell him stuff. I guess. And just writes prescriptions. There's a whole bunch of problems with this doctor, but we'll get to those. Yeah, but he, uh, he's gone now because the whole place has been burned down. Lights on fire. It'd be a national story if there was a fire on Harley Street. I would think so. Yeah, it'd be a big story. Off we go to the fox and the goose. Now, this is what you were mentioning earlier. The cost in Echo is the greatest paper ever invented. Not only... Have they got it on the front page already? But they have Carlotta's picture. Carla. Carla. But they don't know who she is. How did they get that picture? And it's not a photo of her body. Did Toby clean her up and prop her, her up and put the lipstick on her and open her eyes and pose her? Where did that picture come from? Toby's amazing, but he's not that amazing. Yeah. How do you put a photo on the paper if you don't know who she is? And all we had was a naked body. Yeah. A foreign naked body. Yeah, they don't know who she is. And um, Gloria Bradley, who's like the maid of all jobs at the hotel, she seems to do everything. She does everything. Is organizing the papers and everything. And clearly is supposed to take a paper up to Mrs. Pike, but hasn't. No. We return to the Barnaby household where uh, Tom is so engrossed with what he's doing. He's not eaten his breakfast and it's cold. Cully has a little tantrum. She does. It's cold now. She just dumps it out. So they decide they're going to meet for dinner. And you know he's not going to make it. No. You know, from, from the time they mention it, he's not going to make it. So Troy has an idea of who the body is. Mm-hmm. And they go back out to the hotel. They must have just asked the reporter, because they obviously know. <laughs> I would assume so. Yeah, they head back out to the hotel, and Gloria's there uh, and says that well, the, the reason why they think they know who she is is because Gloria has called the police and said, I recognize her. From as, the picture in the paper that we don't know the source right, of. Right, because that's Carla Constanza, and she was staying in this hotel. Not George Constanza. It's Carla. It's Constanza. Constanza. Not Costanza. Okay. And that she heard her having a fight in her room. She was booked in for a week, but she stayed for one night and hasn't been back. It was a right on Barney. <laughs> and uh, they go into Carla's room and they find that in her diary, it says on the day that she died, 1400, meaning two o'clock, right? Yes. Draycott. Draycott. So now they've got a hot lead. They got a name. Then Mr. Pike comes home. Leonard comes back to the hotel and honks. Honk, honk. To let his mother know he's back. He's nice. He's a good boy. No. No. No, he's not. He's not. <laughs> It, and it, it's so Bates Motel now. As soon as you know his mother's upstairs. Yeah, it gets very he's Bates He's so Motel. Norman Bates all of a sudden. More than we know at this point. So he comes in and Barnaby and Troy explain what's happened, that there's a body in the woods strangled. And he does some good acting here. He does. No, it's not possible. Because he knows it's not possible. Because he didn't put her there. 
Yes, because he's the strangler. Unlike the other three. (laughs) Don't take the papers up to mother. Yeah, he says his mother's dying. Well, she's been dying for five or six years. We're used to it now. (laughs) We're getting used to it. But then he's very proud of something. His up-to-the-date phone system. That's right. It's very technologically savvy. And we find Carla made two calls. Yeah, she called... Um, the Merrill household, and she called Monarch. The phone, it rings. <laughs> Leonard goes up to see his mom, who's not dead. No, she's not dead. Nope. She's in a wheelchair, and she's got a couple IV bags. Now, wait a minute. One okay. of which... She has the cancer, and she's in IV bags. She has IV bags, and she's in a wheelchair. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say she's an invalid. Yeah. Okay. I'll bring that up again later. <laughs> At least she's very, very weak. Frail. Her her four poster bed is surrounded by plastic sheeting. Yeah, I know. Which is that. weird. Yeah. Is she the boy in the bubble, but the old lady in but the only, bubble? But only when she sleeps? I guess. And one of the IV bags looks like a blood transfusion. Whose blood is in there? You do not give blood transfusions at home. Or over a period of time. The, the district nurse is not going to stop by and hang a bag of blood and leave. No. Nope. That just doesn't happen. No, because she's in another episode, remember? <laughs> yeah, later. <laughs> yeah. Um, but He lies to her, says... Yeah, they were just there to, to warn him about some counterfeit money that's going around. The Lord wants me to suffer. He's punishing me. Oh, she's so bitter. <laughs> Leonard, no paper for you. Yeah. <laughs> Read your Bible. <laughs> then we're off to Monarch Tobacco. Or, as I like to call it, a manor house. Now, wait a minute. Before we go there, one question. Yep. He gives her the Bible to read instead of the newspaper. Yes. And says, read Ezekiel. You like Ezekiel. Do you know anything about Ezekiel? Oh, it's got all the rules and it's got all the retribution and the revenge stuff in it. Ah, so that's why he knows she likes it. Yeah. Because we're not giving any spoilers away here. We all know this, right? He is one of the killers. Yeah. So he, he is responsible for the three earlier stranglings and she knows that. Yes. Which is why she's clinging on to life because she's told him. If you kill again, that's it. Yeah. No more murders while I'm alive. Yes. Like once I'm dead, go for it. (laughs) (laughs) So I have a problem with his character then. So why does he just kill her? Yeah, really? (laughs) He had no problem killing these other girls. Why does he just kill mom and then kill other girls? Can't kill mother. Not mother. He doesn't like her. But that makes, it makes more sense then why he gives her the Bible and says, read Ezekiel. Because she's all into rules and punishment and retribution. And she's alive just to spite him. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So then we go to Monarch Tobacco. Sorry. Which is in a manor house. Yeah, of course it is. And we meet Bill Mitchell. Yes. Who is played by Jeremy Clyde. That name's familiar. No, it wasn't. It wasn't familiar to you till I told you. Jeremy Clyde was in this awesome musical duo called Chad and Jeremy. Chad and Jeremy. Back in the 60s, they made a couple of really great songs that if you're of a certain age or if you have parents of a certain age like I do who exposed you to their music, you won't recognize these. We'll have to include them in the show notes. Yeah, I'll include the music They're in the fantastic. show notes. They're fantastic. They are. And as soon as I saw his face, the first time I saw him as an actor in an episode, I thought, he has a face sort of like King, Prince Charles. He has kind of those, I don't know, Stuart features, sort of. Yeah. So not only was he in this, I'm not going to say they were a rock and roll band. They no, were, they were more like a folky duo. Like a Simon and Garfunkel kind of duo. Without the crazy Simon and Garfunkel stuff. Right. <laughs> or the Afro. There's yes. no Afros involved. No, no white Afros. man Afros. Um, Maybe Toby should have been in the <laughs> He's got the mullet, not the afro. He's yes. more, he's more uh, you know, makeup metal than... Yes. Yeah. But Jeremy Clyde has royal connections. Royal connections? So his great-great-grandfather was the first Duke of Windsor. Wow. The current Duke of Windsor is his cousin. Oh. But because his grandfather was also... Duke of Windsor. Yes. When Queen Elizabeth had her coronation, Jeremy Clyde was in it. Wow. He carried his grandfather's crown. Wow. In the coronation. That's crazy. Which was a gigantic TV event. Huge. There's got to be footage of him as a little boy walking behind his grandfather. That was a huge British TV event. Like that was like the first 
major British television event that everybody tuned in for. Was that before or after the moon landing? Oh, it was way before. Yeah. It's in so the 50s. It was like the reason to buy a TV. Yes. Right? Yes. And the whole neighborhood would gather around. It was like the TV. moon landing. Yeah. Where everybody watched it. There's a, there's a Doctor Who about it. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I remember that now. Yep. Yeah, so he, he's, got some, uh, he's got some cred. He does. He's a good actor, though. And he, so he, he's in charge of, of Monarch Tobacco, which means he's John Merrill's boss. Yes. And he's also Carla Constanza's boss. You know who else is in charge at Monarch? Troy chatting up that receptionist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Asking what she's doing. Hey, baby. Hey. What are you doing? I'm Troy from Costin. <laughs> <laughs> Remember me? Where are you from? Uruguay? So they have a <laughs> very important brand of cigarettes. With the worst logo in the universe. <laughs> oh, my God. Just, like, her eye makes it look like it was her eye was removed and then they painted it. <laughs> it's like really big and her eyelashes look like I don't know tarantula legs coming out of her face it's it's not even pop art it's like it's supposed to be realistic and it's so not it's so so, so we find out that Carla was the spokesmodel for this brand the brand was called Carla before they found her but because it's a brand to be marketed in South America they wanted a South American spokesmodel and they found Carla whose name just happened to be the same name and she became a huge star because of this right in South America specifically in Brazil she's huge yes very well known and they, uh, he's freaking out. This is bad for us. They ask about Draycott, and he says, I've never heard of him. Right, which gives him away because it's Dr. Acott, we find out, right? So the fact that he knows that it's a, a man and not a place or something like that. So now, okay, I need to go over this. They go to the hotel and talk to the maid and find out that it's Carla. Right. They go directly from there to Monarch. Right. Okay. What I don't understand is the next scene, John and Kate know that it was Carla because the radio said so. Yeah. See, if John knew, that would be okay because you can figure Bill is probably going to call him and go, dude, we're in trouble. Our spokesmodel's dead. But he says he heard it on the radio. Yeah. And... In the previous scene at Monarch, Burnaby says, we're going to have to release this the name to the media like it's going to happen in the future. Maybe Troy called the radio station from the car. Best media in the world. <laughs> Not only can they get a picture before... They know who they she have is. A, who knows who she is. They can release her name before they even have confirmation. Of yeah. It. <laughs> John says that, uh, okay, so my watch isn't at the repair shop. I lost it. It wasn't a lie. Very angry. <laughs> but then Tom and Troy show up and start doing some sleuthing. They do. There's clay on the tires of his Land Rover. Hmm. Mm, just like those weird blotches of clay in the woods. Those were weird. Like what prop person had to put blotches of clay on the I, ground? I don't know. <laughs> and then Barnaby pokes at it with his pen. Yeah. <laughs> I poke at it with his stick. Kate just throws Anna under the bus. But um, but um, Anna goes under the bus. Now I have a question. I missed this earlier, but I want to ask about it. Troy speaks to Anna in Spanish because he's taking Spanish night classes. When they leave the house this time, yeah, that's when yeah. he talks to her. Yet she's Portuguese. Now I know they're similar, but one of the things that when we went to Brazil that people said was, "Don't speak Spanish." Yeah. They'll be insulted. Right. Like, if you don't know the Portuguese word, don't say the Spanish word. But Anna's nice. Amigos! <laughs> Gosto Whisperer! <laughs> so, we went to Sao Paulo, what was it, like 10 years ago now? Something mm -hmm. like that? We were in Sao Paulo. And More than 10 years ago. We were just kind of relaxing in the hotel room between these gigs that we were doing. And we're watching Portuguese TV, Brazilian TV. And this is when the show Ghost Whisperer. Ghost Whisperer. <laughs> it was really popular. We kept seeing ads for it. And they called it Ghost Whisperer. The only Portuguese I remember is Obrigado. Yes. And, and there was some strange television commercials in Brazil. Yeah. Remember those commercials? Yes. Well, we see the Carla commercial. It's strange. 
It is indeed. How many sweaty banditos can you have in one commercial? And they realize that it's very different than British advertising. She lights a match on a guy's face. Ow! That would hurt. That would hurt so bad. Never mind that it wouldn't work. Because that's not how matches are that's made anymore. You have work. to strike it against yes. that surface for the chemical reaction to happen. Anyway. Back at the Merrill house, we find out that John takes baths. Always a bad sign in this show. <laughs> gonna go take a bath well we'll see another bath later on yeah too. and kate goes and visits david she's tucking him in and guys you may not have noticed this when you watch the episode watch this little bit again she goes in david's in his bed she's gonna talk to him specifically about the night in question because yep. she's away she was volunteering on the helpline with Who mrs else? bundy mrs bundy <laughs> and while she was while kate's away doing that this is the night of that the murder occurred between nine and midnight. Yes. So John and David were at home alone. And that's his alibi is that he was home with David and read to David. And then David says to Kate, actually, dad left for a little while, but I think Anna was back by then. So he wasn't alone anyway. But I could have dreamt it. The thing I want you to look for if you rewatch this scene with Kate tucking David in is the weirdness of his bedroom door. She has to like climb over like a rafter. To yep. get into his room. And it's kind of like a parallelogram door. And we've watched enough British restoration shows to know that some of those old listed houses have second floors added on where there wasn't one before and you can't move the rafters because they're protected and so you have to kind of build around them. But I've never ever seen somebody leave one diagonally across a doorway. And move the door. Yeah, exactly. And he has... Comic book pictures on his walls, including yeah. Spawn and things like that. But that door is just, wow. It would get on my nerves climbing over so, it every day. So he throws his dad under the bus. Totally. So Anna and the dad are under the bus now. Yep. Barnaby goes home, but he's forgotten something. Cully's at the restaurant waiting for him. And the next morning, she's pissed. She should be. She should be. I thought there were cell phones by now. Why couldn't he call her? I, I think he know. didn't even remember to call her. But he has a plan. Yeah. He's got two tickets for the Pinter play. Tonight. No, he doesn't. Well, he says he does. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Meekum is like, the killer is going to strike again. The first time it was on the 13th. And the second time it was eight days later than the 13th. And today is eight days later than the last time it was 13th. And it's a full moon, even though we see the moon in a few minutes and it's not full. It's like three quarters. It's but somebody else is going to die. Because exactly. he's Meekum and he's showing his teeth all over the place. Arr, arr, arr. He's so strange. In there also, Barnaby goes to get the tickets for the caretaker, the Pinter play. He goes to the Costum Playhouse. Let me tell you about the Costum Playhouse. Tell us about the Costum Playhouse. So, somewhere in there, they go to the Costum Playhouse to get the tickets, which an old lady says is sold out. But Speaking of old lady, okay, the ticket seller. Yeah. Elizabeth Tyrell is her name. Yes. She was also in Death of a Hollow Man. Was she? She's old lady. Because she refers to Death of an Old of Hollow Man. I know. Well, because Tom does. Yeah. Because she's like, oh, do you think there's going to be another death? He's like, I don't know. Anyway. So remember, in that, they called it the Corn Exchange. No. Yes. Oh, yes. In Death of a Hollow Man, the theater is called the Corn Exchange, and it's a completely different in, exterior. In Death's Shadow, it is... The Costin Theater. Right, because they're two different theaters. And this is the Costin Theater, too. The Costin Playhouse. This yes. is where Cully had the workshop with Simon Fletcher. So this is in Wallingford. Uh -huh. And the name of the building is the Corn Exchange. <laughs> the Corn Exchange was built in 1856, and this theater and cinema was home to the Sinden, Sinodon Players, world-famous detective writer, Dame Agatha Christie was a former president. The creator of Hercule Poirot and Miss Marple lived on the outskirts of town for some 40 years and was buried in a nearby churchyard. Situated on the east side of the marketplace, the Corn Exchange is well known in Midsummer Murder fans as the Coston Playhouse. That's great. So the two theaters so far in Midsummer are the Corn Exchange and the Costum Playhouse, but the Costum Playhouse is actually, in reality, the Corn Exchange. Yes. It appeared in four episodes, Death of a Hollow Man, Strangler's Woods, Death's Shadow, and Death of a Stranger, which we haven't got to yet. Several instances, members of the Sidden Players 
are used as extras. That's who, great. Who could forget the scene in The Death of a Hollow Man when during the performance of Peter Schaefer's Amadeus, the lead character commits involuntary suicide on stage? Involuntary suicide is not something you hear every day. No. That's almost as good as Toby's noogied mullet. I accidentally killed myself. <laughs> Oops. So he gets tickets by using his badge. Really. Yeah. He does a good thing to get the tickets. And they see Anna, who's bought a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. Meanwhile, Kate's finding, she's digging around in John's stuff, because now she's looking for evidence, because she's convinced that he's guilty of something. And she finds a shirt with so much lipstick on it. Like smeared. Like a giant amount on, like, the shoulder. That's not lipstick on your collar. In that narrative, he strangled her. And then rubbed his shoulder all over her face. <laughs> well, maybe she struggled and like, you know, against his shoulder while maybe. he was strangling. I don't know. Worst killer ever. <laughs> I'll leave my watch and this bloody. It's not blood, it's lipstick. Li- lipsticky shirt here. Yeah, I'll just bury it in my wardrobe. Nobody will ever find it. Hey, you know what? It's Troy's birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Troy. And what's P- Troy going to do? Skulk around a hotel for his birthday. And cause the death of another character. <laughs> That's true, he does. So while Tom's talking to Leonard about the old murders um, and seeing if he recognizes Carla and if he recognizes John and um, Mitchell, Troy is pretending to get a drink in the bar when he's really upstairs. Talking to old lady. Dorothy Pike. Dorothy Pike. Casual sex. Casual sex. Oh, the way the way Leonard says it is so... But who has been having casual sex? John and Liz. John and Liz. John Merrill and Liz Francis. Wow. Bow, 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 bow. The Joneses. You don't take... Sting's wife to a hotel. No, you don't. (laughs) He's going to come over and play his bass and be friends with you. (laughs) You don't think he'd get mad? And Troy tells the old lady that, no, no, it's not 20 pound notes. We're investigating death in the woods. And she freaks out. Vengeance is mine. Vengeance is mine. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't blame her for that. No. She's lived all these years thinking her son is a killer. Well, no, knowing her son is a killer. Knowing her son is a killer and thinking she has stopped him and now he's done it again. Again. He at least deserves to be grounded. It's not possible. Kathy wants sex. (laughs) The way he says it is so... (laughs) Lady Jane goes to see Bill. Who is her uncle? Why were we not told this before? We're not told this until now. Okay. So then there's this weird mirror thing. (laughs) At the golf club? Yeah. The weird mirror thing? Yeah, I think the director was just kind of No, I think they're at Monarch. Doing some tricks. No. They're at a golf club. Okay. Yeah, she's talking to to Bill about, oh, I think my husband's a killer. My husband who you got a job for in your big company. She just basically goes through all the clues. Yeah. She lays it all out for him. Isn't that convenient? Yes. And then she phones Barnaby. And Barnaby has the Spider-Man dilemma. Which is? Should I go meet with Kate Merrill and find out what she knows about the killer? Or should I go to the play with Cully? When I've already let her down once. But Kate will only talk to him. Only is going to talk to him. There's a, a, the scene when he's on the phone with Kate. They do this kind of close-up of the side of his head while he's intently on the phone. And, and we find out that his ears pierced. His ear is pierced. Which it doesn't. I guess it doesn't surprise me. I don't. I doubt that he John Nettles has worn type. an earring for a long time. But yeah. Meanwhile, Meekum is weird and goes out again. I'm going out. Me and my red herring tie are going out. Well, Emily's watching a show about praying mantises, so she's yes. busy for the evening, I guess. But it's nice to know that Leonard Pike recycles. A lot. He's got a bar. They've got a bar, so. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when we see that it's not a full moon, even though George Meekum is like, it's going to be a full moon. Somebody's going to die. No. (laughs) No. Sorry. But somebody is going to die. Poor Anna. Anna just. The truck, it comes. (laughs) (laughs) She's just walking home, you know. Bill, he killed me. (laughs) 
One man, he come. He well, and he, he hits her in the car, and they they do a pretty good effect there. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the windshield of the car gets broken and everything. But Somebody that's not enough. And an ugly leather coat rolls up on that hood. That's not enough. No, though. that's not enough. He's got to inject her with, with neon, neon tobacco, neon uh, nicotine in a, in a syringe. That he just has hanging around? Well, he does work at the tobacco company. They use it for experimentation. Is it not a controlled substance? So liquid nicotine, number one, is not green. Okay? Oh, it's bright green. <laughs> no, it's not. It doesn't look like the ingredients of a glow stick. <laughs> it looks sort to dance, of, I go. It looks sort of like vanilla. Yeah. Number one. Number two, the most common use of limit, liquid nicotine is in pest control. It's an insecticide. I wouldn't talk about Anna like that. Well, he injects her with his glow stick in her throat. <laughs> <laughs> She's not going to a rave. Initially, I thought he was going to back up and run over her again. I thought so too, but no. No. I'm going to give you this clue of how I killed you. I'm going to inject you with my day glow injection. Yeah, because he's trying to frame John, who also works at Monarch. Speaking of John. And used to be a chemist. Yes. Kate tells Barnaby about the evidence. That she found the shirt. That and that found... he likes to strangle her. Okay. Let the kids out of the room for a second. Yeah. <laughs> So the conceit here is that John likes to wrap a rope around her neck while they're having sexy time. Non-casual sex. (laughs) Now, we know John is not the killer at this point in time. Right. That is the worst fetish luck ever. Yeah. (laughs) Like, why couldn't he be into high heels or something? He wanted Carla's big shoes. <laughs> it is just a ginormous coincidence that he likes to strangle people when he's in bed with them. Never mind that she's got a neck like a goose. And wouldn't you notice marks on her neck? You would think. And the same with Elizabeth. Yeah. Liz. Worst mm. fetish luck ever. Yeah. <laughs> and it's got to be bad luck. Because if Uncle Bill knows he likes that, that's weird. Oh. That's really weird. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I hadn't thought of that. She she confides in her uncle, but she wouldn't tell him that. No, no. no. So they go to the, um, so they, Tom and Troy, uh, go to the morgue uh, to check up on Toby's progress with Anna. And, and Toby's and hair is it's even worse. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's freshly noogied. <laughs> and he tells him that she was injected with the nicotine. And <laughs> Now, the actress who plays Anna, what's her name again? Her name is Debbie Chazen. She's not a tiny woman. No, okay. not at this point, no. And she is on that gurney rock solid. Yeah, she is. No bur- no breathing movement. No nothing. Mm-mm. She is a fantastic dead For body. long shots with the, the other actors acting in front of her. So it's not like a still shot. No, she can't just go on breathing there. No. No, she does a good job. She does a great, really absolutely bloody, unbelievable job. <laughs> she's not my corpse of the episode, but she's very good. She's, she's very good. Abso bloody unbelievable is what yes. Mitchell says. Yes. Then we get the awesome, awesome marketing meeting. Is it a marketing meeting or is it an X Files briefing? <laughs> I want to know. It's a dark, smoky room with a projector with slides. Slides. Not PowerPoint. Slides. Because you know they can turn this whole Carla thing to their advantage. Well, they are American. Well, only the one lady is American. And, and she's American. Yeah, she is. Uh, she's credited as Ad Woman. Ad Woman. But her name is Tara Hugo, and she says that this could be to their advantage. Did you find out where she was from? She's British. She oh, st- really. I know. <laughs> British actors are wonderful. They do a lot of great accents, but for some reason, whoever coaches the actors who pretend to be American in Midsummer thinks we all talk like this. Absolutely. I'm American. The only worse American acting 
is in the old Father Brown in that weird castle episode. Oh, yeah. Well, they're all like, yeehaw, I'm from Kentucky or whatever. Oh, it's just horrible. But so Tara Hugo, who just has this like one line, she's kind of interesting. Oh, how so? She doesn't do a lot of acting. What she's better known for is the fact that Philip Glass has written several compositions just for her. What? And she performs them with him. So is she involved with Philip Glass? They're, they're not married or anything like that. I don't know. She also performed with Leonard Cohen. Oh, Lenny. Yeah. So, so we have Sting, Philip Glass, and Leonard Cohen connections here. Yeah. That's amazing. I was just like, well, she must be really special if Philip Glass writes compositions just for her. I guess so. Mm, but, but she's from Texas in this episode. We can use this Carla thing to our advantage. We find out that John researched hyperactive kids, that Bill is Jane's uncle again, and... Kate and David have moved out. Yep. John's in the pokey talking to the police. Barnaby knows all about the affair. You're in deep trouble here, John. And John acts like an utter asshole. He does. He... But you almost can't blame him once you know, especially if her uncle knows about... Ooh. I just want to get you home and put a rope around your neck. <laughs> he probably does now. <laughs> like, your damn uncle's framing me for murder, and you're letting him. So arrest me. <laughs> yeah, so and, John and Liz used to be lovers. Yep. He admits that. And then they go talk to Liz about it. Yeah, and she's just so casual. She's like, yeah, I screwed up. I wrote him a letter. The tea is going to revitalize your energy points. and. The- it's ginseng this time. And why would you need revitalized energy points? For the rumpy pumpy. <laughs> Is rumpy pumpy casual sex? So we have bonking. <laughs> we have ass pirates. Bandits. And bandits. Rumpy pumpy. And casual sex. Casual sex. Yes. She wrote a letter. He claims he never got it. He al- He also did the neck thing with her. Yeah. Which she's like, oh yeah, he liked to strangle me too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Worst fetish luck ever. Ever. (laughs) And meanwhile, they're asking everybody they know, do you know Draycott? Do you know Draycott? Do you know Draycott? Do you know Draycott? Nobody knows Draycott. But then Barnaby has the epiphany later. So Yes. So we return to the hotel. Now, the music here is really Michael Nyman. It's still the theme, but I noticed it's, very Michael Nyman. And if you don't know Michael Nyman, he does the music for Peter Greenway films, and he did the music for The Piano, a film in the in the 80s. And he is famous for staccato rhythms. Mm-hmm. Like dun, 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 with subtle changes between those, right? Like the psycho music. Yeah. So we, we definitely have a psycho vibe because... Leonard's going to take a bath. Leonard's taking a bubble bath. Do you think he uses Mr. Bubble? I don't know. He uses some kind of bubbles. Some stuff. kind of bubbles. So now, when you have a bath, and I know you don't like baths, but let's say you did like baths, mm-hmm. or you have taken baths. I, I am familiar with bath taking. You fill the water in the bathtub. Yeah. And then you get in the bathtub. Right. And then you get down on your butt. In the water. Yes. Yeah. Because it's warm and sudsy. Right. Not not Leonard. What's Leonard do? He stands around. <laughs> singing. But how can his mom be silhouetted like Norman Bates if he sits down? Someone is coming with a knife. We have knife cam. Knife cam. And Dorothy's found a little bit of energy. She's she, an invalid. She's feeble and weak. She's not paralyzed. But he's a grown man. He's not ancient yeah but he's not paying attention he's not ready for it still she's got a big knife and vengeance will be hers dorothea gets some energy she stabs stabs a lot stabby stab stab it's not rumpy pumpy it's stabby stabby kelly's got some colorful pots and then they're interrupted again yeah she tries to make dinner nope nope back out to the fox and hell with the covered dishes I don't know. Every time they have dinner, their food's in covered dishes. I don't think I've ever put a covered dish on the table. They like the covered dishes. I guess. They get out to the fox and hound, and it's gory. Yeah. 
and Leonard. And Toby goes, it's a full-time job around you two. He's washing his hands in the bathroom. That's the crime scene. I wanted him to run his hands through his hair just to make it even better. I wanted him to just rinse them in the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's sudsy water. It's Why bloods not? And blood and suds. Blood and suds. And Leonard's not just been stabbed once or twice. He's been stabbed a lot. Yeah. And he does some dead body acting. He does. So not, so not only is he dead, right? Shirtless. He's Shirt- probably got some swim bathing, trunks or something. Some swim trunks on. But he's laid out in sudsy water. Now, this water's not going to be warm. Because no. they that shot, it's a big scene. There's lots of people. It probably took him a couple of hours. Yep. The water's certainly cold. Yep. He can't get in and out because he'll smear the blood around. Yep. And it's got to be in the spatter pattern. That he's they put in the in. tub. Uh, knowing him as an actor, I've seen him in a bunch of stuff. I bet you he's funny. Yeah. And I bet you he was cracking jokes the whole time he was doing that. And he's a little blue. He is. And I think he's probably naturally a little blue because he's cold. He's, <laughs> his, his nipples are perky, too. <laughs> I didn't notice that. You're weird. <laughs> I didn't notice that. But yes, you did. No. He's, you can't see him, but he's turning kind of pink right now. <laughs> like he did when I said about Bill Mitchell knowing about John Merrill's <laughs> fetish. So, yeah, so he's uh, he's dead in the bubbles. That's what my notes say. And we know who did that. Yeah, we know. It was Troy. <laughs> yeah, because he went and riled up Dorothy and told her, told her the truth about what crime they were investigating, and she's like, vengeance is mine. I have so to kill my son now. They go off to the hospital to see her, and she, compa- she confirms everything. Yeah, and now they know they've solved the old case. So they have to go to the Meekums. Yeah, to confront crazy Meekum. And the wife shows Barnaby the murder room. (laughs) There's so much stuff in the background. He's even got the strings and the tacks. He does. It's it's George Meekum's murder room. I'll have to do the the meme of the guy with the red lines on the wall, but have George's (laughs) head on him instead. But but his wife is so happy. She's like, we can finally leave because he's going to be over this thing. He's not. He's going to be all pouty because he didn't solve the murder. Yeah. And the killer's been there the whole time. You know he's not going to be happy. You, sir, are a red herring. Yeah. Sorry. Meanwhile, Mitchell and David are going out on a boat. It's a nice day for a boat ride. With their flippy floppies. You don't need a life jacket because I'm going to kill you. Yeah. You're not going to survive this boat trip. Joyce is home. Sort of. <laughs> Joyce is in one scene in this episode. <laughs> well, no, two. She's leaving. And when she comes back and goes, wasn't Tom here? Yes, that's, that's true. It. Two scenes. Yeah. She didn't really work all that hard on No, no, in one. the final scene. Three. Yes. Yeah. Tom goes back and he's like, I'm going to go see my wife. No, wait a minute. What does Cully say to him that makes him realize that it's Dr. Acott? Something about Mr. or something like that. Yeah, and so he figures out, oh, it's not Dracott, it's Dr. Acott. So they rush back to the cop shop. Yeah. And who is at the cop shop? Constable Angel. Yes. (laughs) Our recurring character. And he has lines this time. He does. He actually does. He's fantastic. And they go to see Toby and his worse hair. It gets worse. You know, I think it's supposed to be a sign of how stressed he is filling in for George. And they find out that Carla was sick. Yeah. She had emphysema. So that's why she was going to go see Dr. Acott. And then the other lady tells him that Ian Acott was killed. Yeah. And Toby's all confused. And his hair is all confused. Okay. I'm Carla. Mm-hmm. I've made a lot of money from a cigarette company mm-hmm. that I now realize is killing me. Mm-hmm. So I get on a plane and I fly to England. Mm-hmm. And the first thing I do is go see a doctor. Mm-hmm. Now, why do I go see a doctor? Because I already know that it's killing me. Mm-hmm. So why did she go to the doctor? She didn't know. Then why did she get on the plane? Okay. So she knows she's sick. Okay. And she knows she can get better care in England. Right? No, the, that's because not... she doesn't know she has emphysema. Because if she did, she wouldn't have got angry at the ashtray and thrown it into the fire after she saw the doctor. But they have doctors in Brazil. I don't know why she goes to England. I don't, then. I because don't if understand. she didn't go, she couldn't be murdered. 
I also think at this point in history, people are not stupid about what cigarettes do to you. Yes. Why she should be mad at Monarch, I don't understand. I don't like, either. It's kind of a foregone conclusion that that can happen. Lady Jane and they, uh, John have a fight, and it oh, means nothing. John has lost his shit. He has. Oh, he's going to strangle her now. He's got rope now. Oh, yeah. It's time for sexy you, time. <laughs> you, you want me to strangle you? I'll, I'm going to strangle you. Well, I'm going to stab you. Yeah. So she stabs him with a kitchen knife and runs out. He was really drunk. Bill and... The, the, and there's a line here that Bill says. I don't know if you noticed it. Where he goes, it's a smoke screen. And I'm like, get it? Get it? Yeah. Smoke uh, screen? And he reveals David's plan because David is the one who's framing his father. Yeah, because he doesn't like his dad because he knows his dad is having an affair because he's the one who intercepted the letter. It's pure Agatha Christie. Yeah. So David's the one who put the clay on the tires. Yep. He's the one who planted the lipstick shirt, which means that the little creep went into his dad's closet, got a shirt, took it out in the woods, rubbed it on a dead woman's face, and then put it back in his closet. And didn't mess up that face. I don't, she I don't must know. have had a lot of lipstick on. I, I guess there there's problems there, and she was naked, and he's like twelve. Yeah, he's creepy. Yeah, he rubbed a shirt on a corpse's lips. Yeah, absolutely. and then we have the the realization that Anna must have heard Carla's message, and she was taking notes with her little pad. Yeah, so let's get this straight. Carla doesn't really speak English. Barely speaks English. But speaks English well enough to get a diagnosis from a British doctor. No, no, no. Carla left a message in Portuguese. She speaks English well enough to get a diagnosis from a British doctor. Okay. That's what I said. Okay. And then thinks she can call the Merrills home and leave a message in Portuguese and they're going to understand it. Yeah. Maybe they need Troy there with his Spanish. (laughs) Then Anna is standing there with her little notebook as if it's her job to take down notes from the voicemail. She is an au pair. Who doesn't really speak English. So if it's her job to make notes from the voicemail, it's not the right job for her. No, and she does not pair the O. (laughs) Because she's clearly ready to take notes before she realizes, oh, this message is in Portuguese. Oh, and I can blackmail someone with it. Yeah. How does she know about Bill, like... Bad. Yeah. I don't really, I mean. And how does Bill know that she's driving, walking down that way at that time? Well, you know how she is. She goes to Costa and stays out all hours. Well, you know, he's got the glow stick stuff. So. <laughs> the car, it comes. <laughs> the car, it comes. So we get, you know, we get all the pieces put together. Yep. And then Tom goes back to see Joyce. She's in the flowers. She's no, she's in the flowers. It's beautiful. And it's implied that Troy is dating Cully. It's implied that Cully has gone out with a policeman. Yes. And if she is dating Troy, it's Tom's fault because he gave Troy the tickets to go to the Absolutely. theater. Absolutely. Unless it's Constable Angel. <laughs> you think she's dating Constable Angel? I'm pulling for Constable Angel. <laughs> I, have, I have one little problem. Yeah. Well, so, so I'm Bill. My company is in ruins, right? Potentially, yeah. I strangle Carla, making it look like a strangler's wood killing. Right. So that's intent and that's foreshot, foreshot thought, right? Right. Because she confronts him about yes. her being sick. Yep. And he's like, oh, we can't have this. No. Nope. And he kills her. Right. He waits for Anna to walk down that road. Right? He is a cold-blooded killer. Yeah. He's, I would say, he's close to a serial killer at this point. In time. And there's only two. There's only two. You gotta have three. And yet, he just can't kill the boy. Even though he's a little shit. And is like, if he kills the boy, he's home free. Even not killing him, why does he come back to the dock with a boat? That's a big boat. He could have just kept going. Just, just get on that channel and go. I mean, drop the kid off somewhere, you know. Why come back? Sell him into white slavery or something, but keep going. Do you think it was the white slavers? <laughs> That's a Poirot reference. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the Clapham Cook. So thoughts on this episode? 
it's it's got a lot of fun things in it, but man, it's got a lot of inconsistencies in it. It it's it's clear to me that it's not based on the books because I think Carolyn Graham would have plugged those holes. There wouldn't be Carla's photo in the paper before they know her name. No. That stuff wouldn't have happened because it would have been in the book and it would have been tight. Yeah. But I think they wrote this episode to feature characters who were really interesting and they just kind of missed some stuff with the mystery part. I think it went like this. I think they had the Leonard Pike thing hole at first. That there's a serial killer, he kills three girls, why does he stop? Yeah. That's intriguing all by itself. I think they have Meekum, the mom, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I think somebody says, that's not enough. Yeah, so who's the actual killer now? So so they have to add this whole monarch thing on top of it. And it grows and it grows and it grows. I think that is stuck on. Now, I agree that I don't think the whole Leonard Park, Pike thing is enough. Yeah, because if it had been Leonard killing again, that, that's not really a mystery. No, not at all. And Meekum is ineffective because he's clearly closed-minded and not a good investigator. That's why he never solved it, because yeah. he, he didn't know what he was doing. And there's no closure there either. It's no. just the whole thing. And then to throw the agony ants in, and then Elizabeth, who, remember, I said, I thought she was involved. Turns out, is a rather nice woman mm -hmm. who is happy. Independently wealthy and does Tai Chi. Yeah. And just likes a little rumpy pumpy. That's she it. is sleeping with her best friend's husband. She is, That's but she loves him. I think she loves him. I don't know how she could, no. but I think <laughs> she does. Or at least she did. Yeah. But, you know, Kate is really the victim of all of it. Her son is weird enough to try to make his dad look like a murderer. Her best friend is sleeping with her husband. Her uncle is a killer. Yeah. Kate she, comes out very badly. When yeah. it's over, she's alone with her psychopathic son. I mean, what eight-year-old sees a dead body in the woods and goes, ha, a chance to frame my dad. Lipstick smearing. I'm going to go get a shirt quick, quick, and quick. And watch. It's a bad situation. Also, you know, you know why David's weird. He has to climb over that board every time he wants to go in his room. That has driven him into weird land. <laughs> it's not the spawn posters. It's that damn board. So who's best corpse? I think Anna's best corpse. Yeah, see, I, I think uh, Leonard wins best corpse. It's, it's he's pretty in the tight. Water. It's pretty tight. Yeah, he's in the water. The killer's not really a psychopath or anything. It, Mitchell's basically just doing it for business. Yeah, which, what is his plan? Like, I'll kill Carla. Isn't it sad that our spokesmodel got strangled? I guess. But then why kill Anna? Like, these people are Anna like, was going to blackmail him and, as and tell as, everybody. As soon as I'm blackmailed... I become a killer. Now, I haven't been blackmailed, so I don't know. Maybe it pushes you over the edge. He's in charge of a multinational business. A lot of people's livelihoods ride on it. Okay. Then he, why in hell does he have time to drive around on a boat? Rich people do that. I guess. <laughs> With the helicopter, too. <laughs> when he's not strumming his guitar in his little duo. Yes. Or being related to royalty. And that, maniacs... <laughs> His, His Strangler's, Strangler's Wood. Wood. It's a good episode. It was fun. It is. What's our next one? The next episode is season two, episode three, Dead Man's Eleven, Ooh. which has all sorts of fantastic <laughs> stuff in it. So if you disagree with us about who the best corpse of the episode was, let us know. We're going to be sure that we put in the show notes a little link to... Uh, Chad and Jeremy and their musical awesomeness. Yes, and Meekum as the crazy conspiracy guy. Yeah, lots of good stuff there. So thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Uh, once again, we're available on all of the podcast outlets that you might find. Our uh, email address is midsummermaniacs at gmail.com. Our Twitter feeds are uh, at midsummermaniacs, and I'm at typewriter. And I'm at intelligirl. And uh, we just love all the Instagram, Facebook comments. It's just completely still. I cannot tell you how much we are blown away. It's fantastic. Mark Mark comes in every morning while I'm like doing my hair and makeup, getting ready to go to work. And he reads me 
the the latest comments and it's always so fun it's so <laughs> it's a good start fun. to the day so we're, we're so grateful that you're listening and we hope you'll keep listening absolutely thanks for listening maniacs bye bye maniacs bye maniacs again we have absolutely the the uh situation where i don't know i don't know where i was going with that but i think you were just going to repeat what i already said i think so <laughs>